All right, hello everyone and welcome to iGlobal University. My name is Mark Robinson. I'm the director for the School of Business at iGlobal. And today I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing to you a friend and a colleague, uh, Paul Bailo, who has recently assumed the position of president at an e-commerce company called orangeshine.com. Paul, welcome to our uh, Executive Insights podcast. Great to have you on the inaugural uh, edition of this. <laughs> it's great to be here, Mark. Yeah, good to see you, and it's uh, you know always happy. Good. Well, always I happy appreciate to be here. that. And you know, in, in preparation for this, I was looking over your LinkedIn profile, mm -hmm. and as I was reading it, I thought, "Wow, this is like a a who's who of <laughs> American <laughs> corporations, fun. right?" Um, yeah, I sort of a, a portfolio of uh, blue chip companies, uh, entrepreneurial companies, and mid-sized companies. Okay. And just, we don't want to name drop too many names, but you've worked at Infosys, uh, GE Money, Amex, MasterCard, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, uh, mm -hmm. Citigroup. So mm -hmm. you've definitely got the experience, um, you yeah. know, corporate America. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a various background, uh, you know, so I love, you know, the, love the big companies, right? The blue chip uh, branding, the educational experience that I got there from an executive leadership perspective, uh, and then also the small mid-sized companies and then my own companies too. So it's a, I love that mix of organizations. Yeah, I, I think it really speaks volumes about, uh, you know, your capabilities and the whole realm of digital transformation, right? That's going yeah. on today. So, you know, what are some of the lessons learned that, you know, you've experienced firsthand that might help other organizations uh, transform digitally? Yeah. So, so the interesting thing I felt was uh, when I was running some other companies and leading other companies and I was like, I could never really understand why some leaders wouldn't let people work from home. And my view is always, who cares where you work, right? So it's interesting that people were struggling during this, this, this you know, virus that people were like, oh, we need to get people to work from home. You could, you could have done that 10 years ago, really. The fact is that what this shown the light on, the spotlight on, is immature leadership in organizations. And it showed that, that people were really talking the talk of digital, but not really walking the walk. It's like we said, people want to talk about change, but they really didn't embrace it. And the pain that came with the virus for all these organizations was basically, if we want to survive, people have to work from home. Right. But they could have done this before the virus. Right. So in my analysis, it was really like, we're not doing anything different. It was that it was just antiquated leadership that inhibited people from embracing this, you know, in my world, it was like, yeah, go work from home. It's no different than we would normally do. Right. right. So, right. so, so for most people, like, it's like, so that's what goes back to talking about a learning organization where this shouldn't have been like, wow, we're working from home and, you know, oh, we don't have bandwidth or, oh, we need a Zoom account. That just really shows that these organizations are not learning organizations and they're not really embracing the norm. And now you have the other thing that was really interesting is, what is really the meaning of leadership and management? Because when you have people working from home, the concept really is, is well, you need to be in the office so I could watch you. Like, right. why, what kind of concept is that? Is that, your, your, is that your management style that you're like the security guard and people who have families and pay mortgages and raising a child that they actually need someone looking over them? That's right. very antiquated in the thinking. Yeah. So what, to me, what it shows is that there's a lot of organizations that really have to embrace the fact that the way they're operating and their culture and their leadership is antiquated. Um, and then you also really have to question the value of management because when people early on, even when you look at Google, Google had a 20% increase in their code production in the first two weeks when everyone worked from home which proves out that you really don't need managers. You just need people who can, who are, you know, who you have their heart, minds, and souls in the organization right. and they will do the right thing for you. They don't, you know, a manager is there to inspire, to mentor, to advise, to educate, to train. 
no different than like a professor, right? That you and I are, right? Yeah. So, so this idea of, of antiquated management style really came to fruition when the virus happened because the managers who managed by sight and not really instituting, inspiring their employees, they really just said, what are you really adding in terms of value as a manager? Right. And there's this whole, whole thing about digital managers where you really have to understand what does it mean to lead? You know, my experience as a, as a C-level executive, I'm hoping I'm in, in wherever I work and wherever I work, that I'm in the heart, minds, and souls of the employees, right? right? That they're listening to, you know, pieces of what I'm trying to do and to direct them. And most, most of the time I'm trying to be as honest and, and clear and productive and caring as best as I can and being very direct and making sure my, strategy is solid. Um, you know, most people want to work for good people. You, know, you don't have to like everyone, but you have to be able to be in a position of respect and, and really put the employees first. That's why I said in every organization I'm called into to do transformation, it's, it's people, it's the process, and then it's the, it's the, pro, it's the profit. People always have to come first. It, it's, right. you know, if you if that's not your thinking, then I don't think you could ever be a leader of an organization. That that's a great point. And you know, we we both come from corporate backgrounds where if you weren't in the office, you weren't working, right? Right. And when you think once again, right, that's <laughs> like that's like such antiquated thinking, right? Like, so what is it? I could I could just sit there all day and you think I'm being productive, right? Well, I mean, you know, it doesn't people, make any sense. Yeah, people are being even more productive from home. Yeah. So, so, this, yeah. So, I mean, like, once again, it's sort of like in the corporate world, it's like, what's the rules and regulations that you're really trying to inspire people? I mean, does it matter that you're in work at nine o'clock? I mean, some, some, some positions call for like, Hey, the, the factory line starts at eight 45 and you gotta be, I got that. Right. But most other roles, I mean, you know, there's a direct correlation between how you make people feel and how productive they will be. Right. So if you could really just make them feel good and happy and honorable, right, in their roles and then making it mean meaningful and give them the ability to control what they want to do, man, oh, man, they'd be really happy. But if you have really bad leadership and you're not really inspiring people to really be part of this organization and you're really just getting bodies to come in or just, just taskmasters, you're right. just wasting time and money. Yeah. No, exactly right. Exactly.